And so today we have what's called an Ask Me Anything or an AMA. Sometimes in the professional industry, we call them fireside chats because they're meant to be like casual. Like these are the leaders that are coming to you transparent. They want to be, they want to answer your questions. They want to encourage you. And so this morning we have two executives from HP. The first, and oh, I have to admit, I did the ultimate boo-boo. I did not check with the speakers on the proper pronunciation of their last name. And you all know I messed up James's last name earlier this week. So my apologies in advance to Ron and Joanna. We have Ron Garrier, who is the global CIO at HP. And we have Joanna Burke, who's the chief information security officer. Today, they're gonna share their experiences in the industry. They're gonna begin sharing about their personal journeys to their current roles as executives, the, the highs, the lows, and, um, and most important, what were their lessons they learned along the way and how can they encourage you? They're gonna share what it looks, looking, what it looks like working in the cyber industry, what are some of the challenges and how do you stay in the industry long-term? They are here to answer questions. So feel free to be putting them in the Q&A chat because after they share their stories, we're gonna go to Q&A. We do have a few baked in questions, but we really wanna hear from you. All right, Ron, take it away. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. Um, and you hit it spot on. Last name is Garrier. It's a French derivative. My parents are both from the beautiful island of Haiti. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to quickly kind of speak to this group. Um, I'll, I'll be brief because definitely Joanne has a great story, but my role, I'm the global CIO, Chief Information Officer here at HP. Um, you guys know it's probably an iconic brand. 1939, uh, two Stanford grads founded this organization and pretty much seeded Silicon Valley. It was the first company in Silicon Valley. And what you see behind me is actually a um, a backdrop of the garage. This is actually where they actually started. Uh, they had rules they put on the wall and then they started getting to work and they sold products to Disney um, and then eventually the US military and it just blew up from there. So it's pretty exciting. Um, so my journey here um, at HP, I started uh, this organization roughly 11 months ago, very quickly. Um, my history started at Toyota. I started in Toyota back in 1996 on the business side. Um, actually running repossessions. I'm calling you from Chicago, my hometown. And so for my first job was actually looking and knocking on doors and trying to look for payment or car keys. That was, that was an interesting time. I uh, did that for a couple of years, but then I always wanted to get into IT, back into it. So um, Y2K happened and you know, it took off. Uh, Toyota for 19 years, a great organization, then went on to become CIO at Farmers Insurance. Well, we are farmers, da, 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 da. Did that for roughly three years and then went from insurance and finance and automotive to something totally different. I went into pharmaceuticals. I worked for Express Scripts based out of St. Louis. Um, great organization um, at the time under acquisition by Cigna, another healthcare company. Um, I had an option to stay, but I wanted to stay in the Chicago area because both my kids were attending college here in Chicago. Um, so I left and then I went into public sector. Um, the governor of Illinois called one night um, and said, hey, would you mind coming out and help me out with something? Uh, I was kind of reluctant, but I joined. And um, I, I guaranteed him one year to reset the agency. So for a year, for about 18 months, I served as the CIO and Secretary of Innovation for the great state of Illinois, my home, my home state. Uh, great, rolled out broadband. Once COVID hit, I was able to kind of help the state get better prepared, leveraging data. Um, but there's a lot of things I'll talk to you a little bit later on cyber because Illinois was breached in 2016 um, by foreign entities and so for our voting. And so we had to harden that area. And then roughly about a year ago or so, um, I started having a conversation with HP. It's a great organization I joined. So that's my quick journey uh, to where I'm at. I'm going to pass the baton to my good friend and peer, Joanna, and she can talk about her uh, journey. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Michelle, and mostly thank you, everybody who's here giving us your ears for a while. I'm very interested to see questions, anything that y'all want to hear about from us today. Um, as Ron mentioned, I am the Chief Information Security Officer at HP, uh, usually called a CISO or a CISO, and that's kind of one of the more standard titles these days for uh, heads of cybersecurity, basically. You may see it called different things. Uh, CISO is still pretty common. 
And my, uh, my career actually has always been in cyber, but I didn't really intend it that way. When I was getting out of college, which was a long time ago, as you can tell, I started to let the gray come in during the pandemic. Cyber wasn't really a thing. You know, this was the late 90s. If you weren't in the military, uh, you, you didn't really even know this was a field. You know, we didn't teach it in college. We certainly weren't talking about it in high school. And like a lot of people in this field, I was a computer science and mathematics person. I uh, didn't really have an idea where that was going to go, but I liked the topics. They were fun. And I'm like, why not? So I majored in them and I became a software engineer. And I really, I, I believe now that I was very blessed and I was very fortunate because I kind of fell into cyber because I started working for a startup. I did a couple of startups. This was back in the years when we all thought we were going to become multimillionaires by working for startups. Turns out it did not work out that way. And I did work for a few that failed. I learned a lot. And I started working for one that was focusing on making the very first of what we called intrusion prevention system. That's actually an inline version of what was called intrusion detection systems for a while. You can still find these technologies in use, although they've been very much commoditized by now. And that really started me of the field in cyber. And, you know, like some CISOs, but not all, I actually worked on the product side for the majority of my career. I spent a long time actually developing, coding, and making security products versus what I am now, which is what we call a practitioner. Uh, the practitioners are the ones who do it. They make it real. They don't make the product. They buy the product from other people. And I've been on that side of the fence for about seven years now, I guess. And having that breadth has been really, really interesting, but at about 25 years now in the field, I've certainly seen a lot of changes. And one of the best changes I've seen is people like yourselves actually know that this is a thing now uh, as you're starting to think about your career and you can kind of structure what you do and what you want and what you know and what you don't know around it. So really happy to exchange with all of you today. All right, thank you both. Great intro there. Hey, and I forgot to ask, and so now each of you have to share because all week we've been sharing fun facts. So Joanna, we must hear a fun fact. And then Ron, we need a super fun fact about you. Well, I will, um, since you mentioned my name first, I'll go first. I'm gonna reach across my desk and show you what makes up the majority of my home office. And that is that I have an entire wall in front of me full of this, is yarn. I love to knit. It's my favorite thing. I love creative fiber arts, and it is one of my best coping functions for the nature of this job as well. Wow, now that's pretty cool. I never heard of creative fiber arts, but I'm going to start using that term. That's awesome. All right, Ron, we're expecting something super fun and cool here. Well, it's not. Well, I'll make one short one and another one somewhat a little bit timely. The first one is um, I used to race motorcycles and stunt ride, um, something that was a joy, um, but once you have kids, you realize maybe that's not a good thing to be doing on the side. Um, but that was one. But the other one is I'm actually a descendant of Philippe Guerrier. He is a pro well, president of Haiti way back in the mid 1800s. Um, and given the unfortunate turmoil in Haiti right now, um, it's just one of those timely things. He served for nine months, but he was a general during the revolution that ousted Napoleon back in 1806. So that's a fun fact um, for me, I guess. Wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, racing motorcycles, that's pretty cool. And I know about, you think, well, maybe my kids should do that. I just found out yesterday that my my grand, my son has gotten our grandkids into riding and my oldest grandkid there, who's 18 and he's six, four and weighs about 240, just got his first dirt bike. I'm like, so. <laughs> yeah. Racing around the property. All right, so we have a first, we have some bait questions, but this is a great question. Joanna, I'm gonna, and, and it's yours. They're like, well, what exactly does a CISO do? I mean, do you knit how, all day? How long do we have for that yeah. answer? <laughs> 30 seconds, no. Okay, all right. We actually uh, have people on here that wanna be CISOs. Great. Somebody said I love that's it. me in the future, yeah. I love it, that's great. I, I'm gonna give you the short answer. Um, and the super short answer is what I tell you by the time you do it in a year or five years is going to be totally different. And what, as I've been doing it, it's been totally different. Fundamentally, what the job comes down to is 
you are responsible to be the advisor and the subject matter expert to guide the enterprise that you're a part of to do business in the appropriately cybersecure way. And I think appropriate is a really important word in there because if you wanted to make the most secure phone ever made, it would take 15 years, it would cost $2 million and it would probably function about as well as a rock, right? So the whole art to this job is taking the knowledge you have about cyber and applying it to the company that you're in to guide them. Yeah, now it's a big role. I have worked for CISOs for many years because I've been in cybersecurity for 30 years. And so we always ask them, I'm, I'm gonna then we're I'm gonna ask this and then we're gonna go to the next question. So what keeps you up at night? Oh, you know, the thing that keeps me up at night is something happening that I should have anticipated and I didn't. You can't let the thing keep you up at night be what might happen. That's unproductive and you'll never sleep. And what are you going to do with that? So what yeah. you have to frame it around is what should I be anticipating? How can I best anticipate that? And then put operations into place to recover from what does happen. All right. That sounds exciting. Yeah, the CISO is the one. Um, <clears throat> they will get the call in the middle of the night that you don't want to get. Oh, we have a, a little problem. We need to take some action. And then the CISO often will call the CIO. And so, uh, Ron, what, what, how did you, when you, when you were on that path, they've become a CIO. What were actually your thoughts? I mean, was that like intentional? You wanted that level of leadership. And then in your role at HP so far, what do you like best at working at HP? That's a, that's a great question. So I'll answer the first one, of course, first. Um, when I went to college, my degrees are in finance, economics, and a minor in history, African American history. And I went on to get my MBA, um, more in business and strategy. And so my, my thought going into University of Illinois was to be an architect. My, that was my master plan. Growing up in Chicago, seeing the great buildings, my dad was a structural engineer. He used to come home and tell stories about how the Sears Tower was made. So very exciting. That was my intent. Um, but then I got into IT and I loved IT in that it was always different. No two days are the same. Um, being a finance degree, every there's a month end close and you rinse and repeat every month until the rest of your career. And I thought that was kind of bland. And so IT was always changing. It was adjusting. And I joined Toyota in IT where I love cars. I love tuning cars and I had a 97 Supra. And then I love the technology side. So that was my exciting moment. Did I expect to kind of ascend to the role I'm in? Absolutely not. What kind of prompted me was every time you get to a certain role, you're like, okay, I made it. You know, like you have this feeling like, okay, I've made this threshold. Like you defeated a bad guy on a video game, yay. And then you realize you look around and you're like, wait a second. The people that I used to look aspire to become, they're human just like I am. They make the same mistakes I would make. I think I could do a good job, maybe even a better job getting to the next level. So it was always just trying to make it better for those around me. Um, I truly feel if you make it better for others, it'll come back to you. That's truly how I feel, how I was raised. So that was kind of the big thing. Now, HP um, is an amazing company. I, HP is truly about reinvention. Um, there's a lot of things that HP technology does today that you wouldn't expect they do. So for example, you know, you have the Smile Direct Club where you have um, braces that they give you a different one every month and it changes the size. So ultimately your teeth get straighter and straighter and straighter. That technology is actually an HP technology when it comes to 3D printing, for example. So there's other things that HP is doing that's beyond the traditional laptops, printers. There's so many things that are cool. Perhaps one day we will be printing, um, not real, but um, kidneys and livers. You never know. We're getting into the medical field. And so imagine that instead of having a donor that you're looking for, which is unfortunate because someone has to pass for you to kind of live, what if we could create that organ that you desperately need from 3D printing and organic material? That is exciting stuff. And HP is leading the way there. So for that, that is exciting things. And to one question that you didn't ask, but what keeps me up at night is what keeps my friend Joanna up at night. Um, it is the unknown. It is not knowing where that bad actor is going to come from. But more importantly, Joanna and I inherited a lot of legacy technology, old technology 
And usually that's where the bad actors take opportunities and run with it. So those are the things, what did you inherit that you didn't know you inherited? And how can you try to kind of avert those problems? Wow, great answers. Hey, in terms of printing the kidney, you just talk to a page out of my presentation at the end of the day, right? Okay. Print what you need when you need it. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, Joanna, I see you tagged a couple of questions. I'll let you take one of them right now. Pick which one you like. These are fabulous questions. Um, and, and two of them, I think the answer is strongly linked together. One of them is how do you master to an appropriate level all the different pieces? Uh, not only different types of technology, but, but all kinds of things. And then also, you know, what advice would I give? My answer actually really links those things together. And um, one thing that I did in my own career that I did unintentionally, but I would recommend it to anybody, is I actually went very broad in the positions that I did for about 10 to 15 years. I spent a couple of years being a software engineer and then I became a manager of software engineers. And then I became a manager of manager of software engineers. And I realized this is okay, but I kind of feel like I'm not really learning anything anymore. I wanna learn something different. So I stepped out of management and I went to be an individual contributor in product strategy. That was fascinating because all of a sudden I was on the side of the table telling the software engineers what to do. And that was really interesting for a while. But then that sparked my interest in, well, you know, I wanna go get a little closer to the revenue now. How does the revenue actually come into the company and how can I get close to the customer? So I spent a couple of years doing what we call security evangelism, which is really salespeople keep you in their back pocket and you help them speak to customers with your cyber knowledge. And I did all these things because honestly, they were just interesting and I wanted to learn. And what I realized after doing it for a while is all of a sudden I had built up this really broad set of knowledge where I knew some, not enough to be a, a complete expert, you know, but some about a lot of things. And it turns out that is a great tool to be a CISO because you need to understand some about business strategy. You need to understand some about what motivates customers and what motivates users. You need to understand some about how you articulate how do you talk about risk? How do you articulate very esoteric things in an accessible way? And unintentionally, my broad background had set me up for that. So I highly recommend going broad because it may not take you to the CISO seat. It may take you to the CEO seat. It may take you to the CIO seat. It may take you to fixing up and reselling 97 Supras because you decided you're awesome at doing that, right? So go broad because it's going to help you figure out where your talents really are, right? And, and I think too, you know, it's always, again, a bit of an art to know how much do I need to know about everything? And I will tell y'all, this has been a struggle for me. Starting as a technologist and an engineer, once I was starting to work at a level where I don't know in depth how the Google Cloud Platform works. I don't know in depth what the feature roadmap for AWS looks like these days. That was scary. And it worried me. And what you do there is you learn what you need to know, you learn what you need to hire for, and you put people around you that you empower and you trust, and you let them go be smart on those things. Excellent answer, Joanna. Excellent. Uh, I have one for both of you. We have more questions, a couple that Joanna's tagged to answer, but I want to take one for both of you, because this is often asked, because I think it's important. Is there anyone specific that inspired you? Maybe have a mentor early on or manager that inspired you to get into your current uh, career path? Ron, we'll go with you first. Oh, um, that's a great question. Um, there is, personally, I'll say there are three people that inspire me and they all happen to be amazing women. One would be my mom, um, her ability to leave the island when she did um, and find a better way in Chicago. So I got to give her credit every single day I see her. Um, the second one would be my sister. I have an older sister who has a PhD in psychology. Um, she's amazing and she's done nonprofit her whole career and she's on local television talking about mental health during a pandemic. So, you know, she's that person. Um, and the third one's my daughter. She just graduated U Chicago, about to go to Northwestern Law. She is just a go-getter. Wanted to go to U Chicago when she was in third grade. Very focused, very driven, like get out of her way and just kind of watch, right? One of those people. And that's my job. I'm her venture capital. So I get that. Um, so those are the three people personally that just constantly 
keep me in check. Um, professionally, it would be a lady by the name of Barbara Cooper. She was the CIO at Toyota. Um, she was amazing. She is amazing. She's retired since. And she is my default CIO slash CIO whisperer. She's the person I go to. And the first time we met, just let me tell you the quick story. She came to visit me one time at her office and she was actually planning on potential terminating me because I was doing rogue IT. I was doing things that corporate didn't agree on. And I did it because I was trying to be customer centric and corporate didn't understand the need. She came, she saw what I was doing. She met with the business unit. And before she handed me my termination paper, she changed her mind immediately and says, wait a second, you're doing great things here, Ron. She tore it in half in front of me and says, take this and replicate this to the rest of the United States. You're now promoted to the next level. That's literally how I got promoted. Went from termination to promotion. I would highly suggest against that strategy. It was not, <laughs> it was not my strategy, but it worked. But she has always been the one to kind of ask me, you know, does this make sense? Is it business centric? Are you thinking three steps ahead? Be a lot more strategic because as everyone knows, technology is evolving so quickly. And so she is that person I would say. So actually, when you think about it, four women are the ones that have constantly um, do that. And again, it's the people that I work with and, and Joanna hit it on the head. I surround myself with some very, luckily in some cases, brilliant women and men. So for me, it's the group that's around me to get me to a better spot. Wow, I love those stories, Ron. And before I pass to Joanna, this is the bridge. In in the finalists, in the overall competition for the, the 25,000, 26,000 people that participated, we had 33 uh, young women, 33% young women. In the finalists, these top folks, some of which are on the call, 40% women. And so we have great diversity numbers. We have great all around diversity numbers and that's very exciting. All right, Joanna, who inspired you? The two, two people come to mind. They happen to be women, um, but I think they inspired me for a different reason than, than women happen to inspire Ron. And the very first one, uh, she is currently the CEO at Siemens US. Siemens is the German manufacturing company that they make a ton of stuff, right? If you see a traffic light, it might be Siemens. And uh, when I was in my security evangelism and product strategy roles, we had a meeting with Siemens and she was the chief operating officer at this point. And she impressed the heck out of me in this meeting because she was nice, she was knowledgeable, she asked good questions and she was very respectful of all the people in the room. And as the highest ranking person in the room, you actually don't see that all the time. And especially, I mean, this was quite a while ago, the, the working culture has evolved for the better since this point in time. Most of the meetings you walk into, the person sitting in that seat would be a little stern. They would intimidate you and they would make you feel like you were you know, a little bit walking a line there. And the message that you get from that is if you wanna sit in their seat one day, you need to act like that. That is not a good message. So seeing her be the way she was, and I ended up, I ended up working for her. And she was the first CEO that I ever worked directly for. And I learned so much from her because I've known her now for 17 years and she is always herself. She is always authentic and she's always nice. Even when she's delivering a hard message, she does it in a way that doesn't make you feel stupid. And to see that be successful was not something you see every day. And very recently at HP, I had the opportunity to be in a small round table with one of our HP board directors. Uh, these are independent directors that are on the HP board to provide governance and oversight to HP. And this woman was so approachable and so pleasant. Her name is Stephanie Byrne. She was the former CEO of Corningware for a long time, super smart. She has her doctorate in chemical engineering. And she was the nicest, most down to earth, most approachable person in her seat. And that to me is incredibly inspiring because unfortunately early in my career, I internalized the message that you needed to act like a table banging, intimidating executive to be an executive. And that is simply not true. And people like that demonstrated every day. Thank you, uh, Joanna and Ron. Hey, going on that on that theme, well, we talked, and I, I brought in the bridge about diversity, 
So I have a qu question for both of you, but I'll, I'll, I'll color it with a little context. Both of you would fall in diverse candidate profiles. Joanna, you being a woman, Ron, you being an African-American man, um, uh, considered part of the diversity spectrum. So did you, can you share like maybe some of the struggles that you had becoming at the sea level and then your general thoughts on the power of diversity, both in technology and in management? Ron, we'll start with you. Okay. Um... So, so for me, it's some of his cliche stuff you've, you've probably heard of, but I'll give a couple, I'll give one or two quick examples. So there's always an assumption that when you're one of a few in a room, clearly you must be out of place. You must not be in the right area, something's going on. I'll give you one example of, of this. So many of you may have heard of Dreamforce. It's one of the largest conferences in, in IT conferences outside of um, the one in Vegas. And this one, I was actually a keynote speaker. I was sharing the stage with Mark Benioff the next morning. There's a huge poster of me up in the corner. And, but I'm looking around the room and I am literally one of the only people of color in the room. Like, and there's probably well over 300 CIOs in the room. It was a CIO invited thing only. And I'm sitting there and I get approached by security and they're asking me, you know, am I in the right place? And I'm, I'm a little confused. I'm like, I got a lanyard. <laughs> Uh, I'm dressed you know, in, in a tie, I got a little cocktail in my hand and they just kept on asking me. So they asked for credentials. And so finally I shared the credentials and I also pointed at the poster of me up there like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the right place. I said, may I ask, why are you asking me these questions? I was trying to say cool, by the way. Internally, I was burning up a little bit, but I know I had to um, play, play it straight. And they said, well, there's other CIOs in the room who are questioning if you're in the right place and we just want to make sure um, thank you. And like, okay. And then as he walked away, like a table or two nearby, they were staring and they, they looked away like, you know, and then I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's bothersome. And then later that night we're leaving and then someone handed me their valet ticket and assumed I must be valet to get to fetch their car. And he literally said, can you fetch my car? And I, I, I swallowed hard took a good walk around downtown San Francisco. And this is not the first time this has happened, by the way. It's probably the fourth time um, over the last 10 to 15 years. And so I swallowed hard, took a walk, and I did the keynote the next morning. And I shared this with Mr. Benioff. Um, he was upset. He was tweaked. Um, but I did it as a learning moment because I wanted to actually impress upon people, treat everyone uh, with respect, whether you're the janitor. And I used to be a janitor at University of Illinois for three years. So custodian on a college campus is one of the worst jobs one could have. Um, and so it was one of those moments, but I was, it's a teaching moment um, and I'll leave it there. Um, the other thing I'll quickly say, um, when I made CIO at Express Scripts, it's a Fortune 25 company at the time, I looked around to find another African-American or black person that's a CIO in the Fortune 100 and I couldn't find any. Um, and so we have a very hard challenge in front of us 12% of the U.S. population is Black, um, but less than 3% are in IT, and less than 1% are in leadership roles in IT. So with that being said, I know we have to do our part, um, but it is, there are moments where you just kind of sit down and wonder, like, how did we get here? But you have to constantly, just constantly surround yourself and give a hand up to folks to get them to the next level. I'm, I'm excited. There's 155 people on this call. 140 of them one day might be a board, um, a CEO, and need a board member. I would be excited to work for some of these folks um, one day. But I'll leave it there. Um, my dog Mojito is starting to bark, so I'll go myself on mute, and I'll pass the baton to Joanna. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. I think you handled that much better than I would have. I would have been one and slapped them up in the face, but you did it in a very professional way. And often what a lot of women have to do is bite their tongue, and then rock it when they're up next, like you did, and use it as a teaching moment. So thank you for that excellent example. Uh, you can see the chat stream. People were all kinds of like, man, that's horrible and mad. So Joanna, tell us about maybe experience you had. I am, if it's okay with you, Michelle, I'm going to pivot the question a little bit because I could give a story. Mm -hmm. I think Ron's is like pretty much the perfect story because yeah. he handled it well. I I've heard it only a couple of times, and every time I wish that he had stolen the car honestly, but he never tells the story that way. Sadly, it's probably what I would have done. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why it's important 
to have diversity in cyber specifically and what we mean by it. Because we still generally are referring to gender and ethnic diversity when we talk about it. That's because we still have a ways to go on both. True diversity, though, in cyber, I think, is super critical because the attackers are an incredibly diverse group. Mm -hmm. They are literally coming from everywhere, every economic background, every cultural background, every ethnicity, every everywhere on the gender spectrum. There is an attacker coming from that place. And if you are designing your cyber strategy by people who are only coming from one place, you are not going to be resilient. And I want to make that real clear because it's too easy for people to get spun up about, oh, you just want more women and more black people in cyber. No, you know what? There's a real reason behind this. And it's not only the moral imperative, which I happen to believe, but not everybody has to believe it's a moral imperative. Everybody should agree, though, it's proper business strategy to have cyber resiliency. Yeah, excellent, Joanna. Uh, very good. Both of you, excellent answers. Man, I wish we had like lots more time, um, but we're actually out of time on this panel. And I know as executives, you probably have a packed calendar. This is, I know this is a special time because it's very hard to get time on executives ca uh, calendar. I think this has been incredibly insightful for our audience. You were transparent, your answers were on spot and I've thoroughly enjoyed moderating this panel. I just wanna give you a huge uh, shout out, shout out. And hopefully we'll see you at a future event we have. Very encouraging. And I know the audience we have, there are future CISOs, future CSOs, and future CIOs that are going to rock yes. in, in the next decade. So I'm excited about that. Thank you both. Thank and you. have a wonderful Friday afternoon and wonderful uh, weekend.